excellent. So now, uh, I can begin the little Dhamma talk for 45 minutes or 50 minutes, followed by the wonderful questions and answers. Uh, what's the title again? What was the name? 45 minutes. Exploring the Dhamma with curiosity. Exploring the Dhamma with curiosity. 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 Cup of tea. Cup of tea. Okay, the reason why tea is important for a Buddhist <laughs> is that this is England. <laughs> and one of the reasons I became a disciple of Ajahn Chah, anyone whose second name was the, the uh, Asian word for tea, was my mother. <laughs> but you know there's two types of tea. There's green tea, which usually comes from Japan, China, those sorts of places. And there's black tea, which comes from Sri Lanka. I call one tea Mahayana tea, and the other one Theravada tea. <laughs> so I like my black tea, especially from Sri Lanka. Theravada tea. <laughs> because it is strong. <laughs> it is interesting. And it is full of flavour just like the Dhamma. It is, tea is very deep, especially when you drink it in a mug, which is very deep. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but more than that, that sort of, t that um, uh, curiosity is sometimes as a, I'm not quite sure that how, um, adventurous people are these days. Because sometimes that when we actually explore things, sometimes people are so timid that when you say meditation, they think, oh, this is really weird or strange. What's going to happen? If I meditate a lot, is this a cult? And in fact, in our meditation center in Australia, that I used people's fear of religions, spiritualities or paths. Because we had a, a retreat center, there's lots of, uh, we want to keep it quiet, we don't want people just wandering in all over the place. So I put a sign up on the gate, trespassers will be prosecuted. Number one, that's not very Buddhist, but also it doesn't, doesn't stop anybody in Australia. Well, a sign like that. So, when that didn't work, I thought again and became much more innovative. So the sign which replaced it, which is still there today, and somebody took a photograph of that sign and they sent it to the Sunday Telegraph here in England and it won a prize. Best, it was, it was a prize for the best sign of the month. It's a very famous sign. And the sign read, instead of trespass trespassers will be prosecuted, trespassers will be converted. <laughs> and that's a much better way <laughs> of keeping people out. They're not afraid of being prosecuted, but my goodness, they're afraid of being converted. They've got no curiosity at all. But I like it when people do innovative things. For example, there was a man in Sydney, you can probably relate to this, now uh, in Sydney, he had a house, and to get insurance, you know, for his house against burglars, he had to have not just double locks, he had to have security mesh over his windows, uh, CCTV cameras, and so many things he had to buy just to get insurance. And his house was just like a, it was just like a prison. And so it also cost a lot of money, so I thought, how can I be innovative so I do not need so many no, bars over my windows, so many CCTV cameras, and so many double locks, and still be able to get good protection. And thinking outside the box, he got a very, very innovative way of getting 24-7 uh, security, round the clock, for hardly any money at all. All he did was to go, is it GQ, the hardware store over here? B, 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 B,
barbecue. <laughs> now, B&Q, he went to B&Q and he bought a flagpole, which he put in his front garden. He managed to get from somewhere an ISIS flag. <laughs> and he put the, the Islamic terrorist <coughs> emblem on the top of his flagpole. And now he has 24-hour surveillance <laughs> by the Australian security forces, even the CIA, the Federal Police, all for no charge. <laughs> that is called being in the Fetzian. <laughs> but that is also just the curiosity. It's not just doing the same old things in the same old way just because it is tradition. You know, sometimes we have traditions and I don't know, maybe it's because of my background in, in science. Always just seeing, is this real? Can we look a bit deeper? Can we find another explanation for this? Don't just do the same old things. Be curious. Investigate. Find out for yourself. It's one of the great things about Buddhism. What attracted it, me to it? It was totally not dogmatic. You can argue, you can ask questions. The whole idea was actually learning to see deeper, to find out, to be curious about the truth instead of people like me telling you what to believe or telling you the truth. So the whole point was uh, encouraging or showing people how to find out for themselves. It's one of the reasons why that I just really don't think that Buddhism or the Dharma meditation is really part of the self-help movement. And to prove my point, there was this gentleman who went to W.H. Smith's bookshop and he he asked the, the person at the counter, can you please tell me where the books on self-help are? in this big store. And the attendant on the counter said, so if I told you where the books on self-help are located, it will defeat my, the purpose. <laughs> Find out for yourself. <laughs> so eventually, <laughs> he found out the section with self-help books, and he opened the most popular one, and he opened the cover, and the first page says, I'm not telling you, find out for yourself. <laughs> that really is a self-help book. But, we're Buddhists, and so you know that actually Buddhists don't believe in the self. <coughs> so if ever I wrote a book, I call it No Self Help. <laughs> That's why if you want to take photos afterwards, you can't, you don't do selfies. <laughs> as monks, yeah, no selfies. <laughs> <laughs> Just like in our monastery. Whenever, you know, there's uh, so many monks in the monastery where I live, that all the food is you know, on the tables. It's like a buffet service. We always have two lines. For those who are enlightened, and those who aren't enlightened. Those who aren't enlightened, it's self-service. Those who are enlightened, it's no self-service. No self-service. <laughs> I try my best. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> but the curiosity is always encouraging people. And, oh, this a long time ago, I think, I'm not quite sure which country it was in. We know there was some uh, Western, actually, no, not we call them Western, they're Asian, some Asian Buddhist family, uh, just had birth of their first child. By Asian, I mean they were white. They were what we call cork Asians. <laughs> we're, all, we're all cork Asians. We're all Asians. Oh, all right. So, it's <laughs> cork Asians, or Asians, all the same. So, <laughs> they, they had a child, and they asked, in our modern age, how should you bring up a child? And if you're a Buddhist, should you bring them up as Buddhists? Or should you take them to every temple, mosque and church there is? Or should you know, teach them nothing and let them find out for themselves? Or should you uh, encourage them to you know, go here and look at this book? As a parent, it's so difficult in our modern age to try and 
give your children a fair education instead of like um, uh, imposing your beliefs, your religion upon them. It's one of the reasons why uh, I, to solve some of the problems in our world, and really anti-religious schools. And to, to emphasize the point, we do have Christian schools, Baptist schools, Islamic schools, I don't know if we have any Buddhist schools yet, in, but do we have any, sorry? There's a Dhamma school. Dhamma school, basically the Buddhist school, another name. It's, but do we have any like Labour Party school <laughs> or Liberal uh, Tory school? We have New Kick school. <laughs> Why don't we have those? Because we think that is imposing a political view, it's brainwashing our children. How old do you have to be to vote in UK? 18. How old do you have to be? to identify with the religion. Can you see the disconnect there? To me it doesn't make any sense. We know that with politics you have to be mature enough, to be experienced enough, to at least to develop your cognitive faculties to be able to discriminate you know, what is, you know, you prefer and what you don't prefer. But with religion we don't do that. So kids are called Buddhists from the time they are whenever they, their parents decide there's something which is wrong there. So the curiosity, if we don't let our kids identify with being a Buddhist or a Muslim or whatever, what should we do? And the answer was always to encourage your children to ask questions. And number two, to be honest. To actually to Reveal truth. And if you encourage your children just to do that much, then if they always ask questions, that will be able for them to, to equip them, to find out for themselves, to investigate for themselves, to inquire, to be curious enough to actually go deep into whatever they're examining and not to stop until they find out something which satisfies the, the criteria of honesty and truth. Number one, it means if you are, say, Buddhist parents, if you think that Buddhism is truthful enough, surely it should be able to stand up to your kids' inquiries and it would, uh, for their honesty, they find, oh, this makes sense, I questioned everything, it makes sense, it's acceptable to me. If it's Islam or Christianity, please, let us question and be curious and actually find out for ourselves. If it feels truthful, great. Go for it. Adopt it. So that idea of asking questions and being honest to oneself and to the truth and to the experience of your life is one of the things which attracted me to this path. It wasn't dogmatic. Everything was up for questioning, for challenge, to see whether it made sense or it did not make sense. And so that is part of our path of curiosity. Not just believing what we want to believe, but often thinking outside the box. I remember a cartoon which somebody sent to me. There was a gentleman about to go off to work, and in the other part of the cartoon was a gentleman's cat, and in between them was a litter box. And the gentleman was telling his cat in no uncertain terms, pointing to the litter box, Cat, never think outside the box. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're a cat, you shouldn't think outside the box. But as a human being, you know, sometimes that we think just far too narrowly. One of the sayings, which I took on board a long time ago, and actually, you know, because I'm well connected, I was visiting Dal Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia some years ago and just had a nice cup of tea with the, uh, the Vice Chancellor, who just happened to be a theoretical physicist as well. And I said, you know, I forget what the, the motto of that university was, but I said, why don't you change it to this one, where everybody thinks the same, no one thinks at all. 
because I heard that somewhere, and he was actually really interested. And I said, wow, that's really a great motto for a university, for a, a place of learning, which is there to move knowledge forward. Not to think like other people do, but to think a different way. Where everyone thinks the same, no one thinks at all. And that's what curiosity is. The investigation, taking it further, finding solutions, which sometimes, you know, you'd never expect, but you're curious enough to find that out. An example of that, which comes to mind, because I put myself in situations which a monk usually never gets into. I used to watch Star Wars before I, not Star Wars, Star Trek, sorry, Star Trek before I became a monk. Apparently it's still going, Star Trek. And I always remember the opening sequences and I've adapted them to my own life as a Buddhist monk. To boldly go where no <laughs> monk has gone before. <laughs> it was to boldly go where no man has gone before. So it's to boldly go <laughs> where no... And I love doing that because you're curious in all these different areas of life where actually this Dhamma can actually lead. So often, I make to make sure that you're not narrow-minded, because I know that you are influenced by the people you meet, and I made a point in my life as a monk of not always hanging out with fellow Buddhists. That made me narrow-minded. So one group of people who became great friends were the Benedictine monks in Western Australia. They were the only other monks. They were the only other abbot we could actually confer on abbot's business. <laughs> and it was amazing, just even though that was a Catholic monastic tradition, ours was a, a Thai forest uh, Buddhist tradition, how much in common which we had and how many uh, similarities and problems we could confer upon, and also to uh, exchange solutions. It was a very helpful dialogue we had, which eventually turned into friendship. And so very often we'd be invited to do many, many presentations, and one I remember was at a, a chaplaincy conference in our local university, representing on just how Buddhists and how uh, in this particular case, Catholic Christians could actually help in the different areas of life. Chaplains in prisons, chaplains to even uh, um, the army and the navy, chaplains in schools, how you know that we could serve in our different ways. And at the question time, which I always think is the most fruitful, instead of telling people we get feedback, at the question time, a gentleman in the back put his hand up to ask a question and he announced his name as Father Frank Brennan and if you're an Australian if you're anywhere close to the intellectual stream in Australia you'd recognize that he was a highly regarded intellectual who was chosen by the Australian government to lead a committee to draft a human rights addition to the Australian Constitution this was a high-powered intellect, a professor, who was regarded with great admiration by so many other people. So when he asked this question, I realized it wasn't the time for one of our Jan Brown's jokes. <laughs> I had to be serious here. This was a heavyweight. So, his question was, and this is, an example of curiosity, thinking outside the box, taking it further than most people would expect. His question was, what is a Buddhist idea of God? Now, it's very easy for traditional Buddhists to say, oh, Buddhists don't believe in God. But that is not curious enough to the question to take it deeper and more meaningful and more helpful. So, just thinking on the run, as I usually do, just 
winging it, as they say. <laughs> I looked at my friend, who I'd had many discussions with. And my friend is Abbot, Abbot Placid was his name, a Benedictine who actually did his, his most of his life in Amberforth, up in the north somewhere, Amberforth Abbey. And that uh, he went over to Western Australia eventually. But he would often tell me, he said, one of my fundamental beliefs is that everybody is searching for God. Now, I said, I'm not going to reject that. I'm going to respect it, even though it's an idea which I've never, very, is, never ever espoused. And many of you are thinking, what the heck am I coming into? You know, is this supposed to be a Buddhist talk? Is that your problem trying to convert me? And I did warn you, trespassers will be converted. <laughs> But no, I started from something which was really uh, weird or even uncomfortable for me. But I said, I respect my friend. But I said, let's explore that, let's be curious about that statement. So, if I take that on board, everybody is searching for God. What do Buddhists search for? What are you searching for? What do atheists search for? And it didn't take long actually to come up with everybody is searching for respect no matter what your sexual orientation, what your age, what your, your nationality whether you are what we call healthy or disabled or whatever it is everyone is searching for respect to, for peace in their lives, in their family, in their world so they can pursue whatever they wish to do Everyone is seeking for love, to be loved by someone and to give that love to other people. We're searching for, for safety, comfort. What are you searching for? And I can say, yeah, I search for that as well. For peace, for comfort, for health. To be able to give love and kindness. Even a monk wants to give that compassion and kindness and service <coughs> to others and be respected back. So if that's what Buddhists are searching for, and my friend says everyone is searching for God, that must be what God means. Respect, peace, health, to love and be loved. And I went on for a few other things which I can't, but you can actually add to that list. And the good Jesuit, high intellectual said, wow, yeah, that makes a good, good answer, one of the best I've heard. Because that was an answer which actually was curious about the question, which respected it, didn't reject it, which didn't follow old ideas, but took it deeper. And one of the wonderful results of that, it took down walls which separated peoples from religion, ideology, race, it actually connected people. And I thought what a wonderful answer that was. It was an example of learning what curiosity is. Not just taking on board what somebody tells you. Never ever, is one of my sayings, never ever let, uh, never ever uh, put... Allow your knowledge. Sorry? Allow your knowledge. Okay. You shouldn't say that, you should let it go. <laughs> Take it further. Never let your knowledge stand in the way of truth. Because I've seen that so often. It can't be. But it is. But it doesn't fit. But it works. You know, that so often happens for professionals, such as doctors, therapists, they're told what to do. They learn their trade. And when it comes to looking after a client, a patient, or whatever, how often is it that everything which you've been taught does not make sense? And you go outside the box, you're curious about the thing and experiment go somewhere where other people haven't gone and my goodness, it works. An example of this again 
of learning how to be curious. When I was first invited to go into a prison to teach, basically to help, I was curious about you know, what it's like in a prison and why they wanted a Buddhist monk to be there in the first place. So the first prison I went into, they wanted me to teach meditation. And I was surprised, very pleasantly surprised, in this small prison, there was roughly about 110, 115 prisoners. About 95% of them came to my class. The only people who didn't come was because they were in solitary confinement or they had a medical condition or some other appointment. Anybody who could came. You know that was so inspiring for me? Surprising. I thought, prisoners? People in jail? They really want to better themselves and learn some meditation, learn some dharma, become kinder, have precepts and be good people? I was so surprised I was inspired. So the first five minutes of my meditation class, oh, I just really gave it so much energy. The very, very best I could possibly do. You know, because I was, these people wanted really important help, I'm going to give it to you. But after five minutes of my talk on meditation, a fellow stood up. He became a very good friend and disciple later on, this guy. He was one of the leaders in the prison, you know, the leaders of the gangs. And uh, he was six foot, and that was just across the shoulders. <laughs> Scar, really huge guy. Quite frightening. And when he stood up and said, can I ask a question? If you're in prison, just visiting, and someone that big and strong says, can I ask a question? You always say yes. <laughs> and it was him who asked me, he said, is it really true that through meditation, you can have, learn how to levitate and fly over walls. <laughs> and then I realised why so many prisoners have come to learn meditation. That is a funny story, but that's not made up. That happened. And when I told them, there's a reason why they're in jail. I think they're not sort of, you know, the, the full complement of candles on the shrine. And <laughs> I can't, I can't resist this story which I told someone. This was, I like reading newspapers, either the cartoons or the weird stories. And this happened in a New York deli. And then, well, it's something to do with curiosity, as I was, I'll, I'll, I'll bring that in. In a New York deli, late at night, there was uh, a, a robber came into the deli, pulled out a gun at the cashier and asked for all the days taking, every cent and dollar which was in the cash register. And of course you have no choice, it's a dangerous situation. So she opened up the, the cash register and gave the, the, uh, the thief everything. But then the thief noticed on the shelf behind the, uh, the, uh, the attendant were bottles of whiskey. She said, I'll take a bottle of whiskey as well. And this incredibly wise, you might say brave, but really wonderful um, attendant said, I'm sorry, sir. In this state, you have to be 21 before I can give you that whiskey. You're underage. And the thief said, no, I'm not. I'm over 21. Well, said the, uh, the cashier, you have to show ID. <laughs> and this stupid thief got out his driving license, see? <laughs> and of course the woman examined it and said, Oh, I apologise, I'm terribly sorry. Here's the whiskey, sir. <laughs> so of course you know what happened next. When she saw the idea, had his name, address and a few other things which she memorised. As soon as he was out of the store, rang the police, here's the name, here's the guy, here's the one who stole it. So that was a very stupid thing to do. But that is not just in New York. In my hometown, Perth, there was a man who tried to rob the jewellery store. And so he picked up a brick 
and he threw it out the window of the jewellery store. Not realising, you know, for insurance purposes, that has to be reinforced glass. Really tough. And so, when he threw it out the window, it didn't break the window, it just bounced back <laughs> and hit him on the head and knocked him out. <laughs> and they had all that on the CCTV camera, <laughs> which was shown on the news. And also somebody you know, put it on YouTube for me to watch. <laughs> oh, that fellow must have felt so stupid. <laughs> so anyway, uh, sometimes epistles are not the best. So when I told them that it takes many, many years, only a few people could, could levitate, and it takes a lot of practice, many years. So the next week when I turned up for the meditation class, only three people turned up. <laughs> <laughs> to confirm that that, you know, is uh, why they came for meditation. But over many, many years I taught in jail. And you know, after a while, you know, you get busy doing other things. So I gave that job to other monks to do. But one day I received a telephone call. And it was a wonderful compliment, one of the best compliments I've ever received, I must admit. One of the ones I remember when I die. And that was the prison officer called, and wanted to speak to me, and said, can you please come back to my jail to teach? And I said, well, I'm too busy these days. I'll send another monk. He said, no, I want you. And of course, my next question was, why me? And he said, I've been in this prison, serving as a prison officer in this prison for most of my career, for many, many years, 20, 30 years. I'm about to retire next year, and I've seen something very unique with all the prisoners who went to your class. None of them ever comes back to prison again. We don't know what you're doing. We want you to do it again. And that just was one of those uh, telephone calls, which I wish I could record. It's in my own heart. It'll be there forever. Somehow or other, you've done something. <coughs> Have people who've been in prison for all sorts of different crimes, and once released, they never went back again. No recidivism. And of course, I started to contemplate what had I done which was different which had meant that they never needed to redo those crimes again. And I soon saw that the reason was, again, thinking outside the box, being a little bit curious, when you see a person in prison, not just to see their crime, but to see the person. And in fact, to this day, I said in all those times I went to prisons, even here in in UK, I've been to many prisons while I've been here, in Singapore and obviously in, in Australia. All those times I've been in prisons, I've never ever seen a criminal. I've never seen a murderer. I've never seen a rapist. I've never ever seen a thief. I've seen many people who committed crimes. I saw many people who had murdered. Many people who had raped. Many people who had stolen. I never saw a thief. In other words, I saw much more than the crime, the terrible thing they did, which put them in prison. There were much more than that theft. There were much more than that murder. There were much more than that terrorist act. There are no such things as terrorists. There's people who've done terrorist acts. When you understand what I'm talking about, you understand that the person is much, much bigger. And I say, I'm going to focus on that part of that person I'm seeing in front of me, which didn't do the crime, it was the other part of it. It's why you see on those bags, for not for sale, for donation outside, you know, for raising funds, water the flowers, not the weeds. You focus on the bad parts, you find that grows. You focus on the good parts, that grows. 
And I was curious about where this leads to. And this fellow was telling me, all those prisoners who actually were with you, you focused on the other part of them, not the criminal, terrible acts which they did. The other part of them. They got what we call self-respect. There was more to them than that terrible thing which they did. And every one of those prisoners I ever met, they always, once you get to know them, they stop trying to protect themselves and their ego. They all admitted to me that they all wished they had never ever done that. I don't know why they did that. They always had huge amounts of remorse. When they trusted you, they would open up. Other people think, nah, as soon as I go out, I'll rob some more. But all it was, they felt terrible about themselves. The total lack of self-respect is one of the reasons why when they left jail, they did it again. They weren't worth being outside. And so, somehow or other, you'd focus on something else which would grow. There was one fellow, just an example. His name was Nick. I always remember him. He was a Greek fellow, of course. Nick, Nick the Greek. But, no, he got involved in drugs. Quick money. Selling drugs. And then got caught. Put in jail for a few years. <coughs> But you know that one of the things he did, and uh, if ever find out this principal of the school, you know, she deserves a medal. The education department, and that I better be careful you know, not to give any indication who this was and what the school was. It was a primary school, <laughs> and the, the government wanted the primary schools to do some event some teaching to try and make sure the children did not ever get involved in drugs. And of course they expected the school to invite professors from universities, so-called experts. I'm sorry if there's any professors here, but you know so little. Theories, yes. It's like looking through the window of a house trying to understand the dynamics of a family when you're outside. So this very courageous, very innovative um, uh, head, uh, head mistress, I think it was, she wrote to this local prison where I was teaching to invite two prisoners to come to the school to teach the children what drugs are really like. People who had first-hand knowledge and were suffering the consequences of what they did. And I wasn't there when they gave those classes, but I can imagine just how powerful that would be when people who had been at the pointy end of drugs and had suffered so badly. It's not just being in jail. It's normal that you lose your wife or your husband while you're in jail. You lose your jobs and your properties. No one wants to employ you afterwards. If you had a choice of employing someone who had been in jail or someone who hadn't, you know, who would you employ? So it's so tough. They've lost so much. They suffered so much. And now they could tell from their heart, from experience, very painful experience, what it's like. And then, the next time I went to the jail to teach, Nick, grabbed me by the shoulder and pulled me to the little schoolroom where imagine what happens at schools or at primary schools after you've been the teacher asks the, the children to please write a little card to thank Nick, I forget who the other prisoner was for visiting the school and he had all these cards on the wall from uh, uh, an 8 year olds, 9 year olds, 10 year olds Nick Thank you for visiting our school. We'll never take drugs. Hope you get out soon. <laughs> <laughs> card after card like that. And this Nick was weeping, crying his eyes out, streaming. He'd done something. He'd actually started paying back in a positive way, you know, of what he'd done for himself and his family and others. I thought, what a wonderful, skillful method that was. 
not just to rehabilitate Nick, but to actually to help people who had really been through it, and uh, to, to actually use that experience of people who have been through it to help children really understand to keep off drugs. Experts, professors, even police. If you haven't been through it, it hasn't hurt you. You can't really know. So what a wonderful thing that was. And anyway, a few years later, I was at the airport, uh, waiting to meet one monk, and someone grabbed me by the shoulder again. I turned around. Hey, do you remember? He said, Nick! And he had a really sharp suit. He said, look how well I'm doing. I still meditate every day. He said, every day I meditate. Thank you so much. It was so pleasing for me to see how these things actually work. When you're curious enough to think outside the box and see innovative solutions. But anyway, when I heard that, I, I've told that story several times. And one way, one time I made that, uh, told that story, was at a, a conference, the 50th anniversary of the Singapore Institute of Mental Health. So I gave a speech there, and after the speech where I mentioned that story, I was taken aside by one of the leaders of the Institute of Mental Health in Singapore, a professor. And he said, I'm a Catholic, but would you please come to my ward to bless it? So I'm a, you're a Catholic, you want me to bless it? Isn't that heresy? What you <laughs> Next me, and he said, no, the reason why I want you to bless this, I was very inspired by your talk. So I said, well, what do you do in this Institute of Mental Health? What's your speciality? Schizophrenia. He was a professor, the head of the unit, which dealt with people with schizophrenia in Singapore. The boss of that whole organisation. Now, I don't know if you have ever encountered people with schizophrenia. I'm sure you have. I have. It's a very, very terrible disease. You know, even your family, after a while, get so fed up with you. And even mothers and fathers just don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. Let alone your friends. It's one of the terrible afflictions of mental health, which everyone, I think, has encountered those. If you have like a child or a member of your family who suffers from that, it just sucks up so much time and you feel so helpless. Does it just have to drug them up to the eyeballs? Which means they've got no, they're in a doze all day long. Is there some other opportunity? And when you're curious enough, you go a little bit deeper, then there are solutions. So this professor of schizophrenia said, I'm professor of schizophrenia, the reason I've invited you to my ward is because just as you said, that's how I treat schizophrenia in the schizophrenia unit in Singapore. What are you talking about? I said, I don't treat the schizophrenia. I treat the other part of the patient that's referred to me as schizophrenic. And I was so inspired. Because I know as a monk, a meditator, that how he's, as they say, on the money. That is the treatment. And the reason I knew that, it actually started off as uh, educational psychology, which I did before I became a school teacher, just for one year. And there was a famous experiment which was done in, here in the UK so many years ago. I don't know the name of the experiment, but it must be over 40 years old now, 45. 50 years ago, but still relevant today. There was a, a school somewhere here in the UK, two classes in one year. At the end of the year, they gave them the end of the year exam so they could stream it for the next year. Now, usually, they would publish the results. They kept the results secret. Only the principal and the two psychologists had access to the results. Because what they did, of those, say, 60 children, the child who came top was put in the same class as the one who came 4th and 5th, 8th and 9th, 12th and 13th, 16th and 17th. The children who came 2nd and 3rd went in the same class as those who came 6th and 7th, 10th and 11th, 14th and 15th. 
In other words, they split the classes up as evenly as possible. And the principal went out of her way to try and choose teachers who had equal ability, as far as you could know. And even classrooms with equal facilities, you know, windows close to the playground or whatever, they went out of the way to make everything as equal as possible, except for one thing. They called one of those classes Class A, and the other one Class B. That was all. And they didn't say why they were in Class A, why they were in Class B. They were totally equal. But of course, no one understood that. Some of the kids went back to their parents, I'm in class A, Dad! How the heck did you manage that? <laughs> well done, I'm proud of you. Although you're getting kicked out of school, how's it make for pocket money? And some of the other children, Daddy, I'm in class B. Right, no more bally for you. You have to stay behind and do more studies. Because the parents thought the class B was uh, the less intelligent. And even the teachers thought the same. So they never taught or expected so much of their class, it was class B. Class A they taught at a high level and encouraged them more. And even the children themselves, they were in B. They thought they were class B kids. And after one year, the chilling result came out. It was chilling when I first read this. The people in class B did so much worse. In fact, they did as you would have expected, statistically, if they had been chosen as the bottom half in the year before. They literally believed their designation and they became class B children. And those in class A believed they were class A. They became class A children. Not because of any ability just because of what people said about them. And that was chilling, and that changed a lot of the way I looked at things. So have you ever had schizophrenia? Are you schizophrenic? Are you ODHD, whatever it's called? <laughs> Are you depressed? And like I've done a lot of work with people who are depressed. They call you depressed, and some expert says you are. You become depressed? I'm sorry, but that's my experience. That's my understanding of the nature of the mind. You become what you believe you will be. So, that is thinking outside the box. Okay. And that's... I'm going to get into this now. <laughs> that is curiosity. So, are you a class A kid? A class B kid? I'm curious enough to challenge those boundaries and designations. That really worked. And this, this is not just theory. Real life. If you've got a kid who, I'm getting into trouble here, I don't care. I got into trouble many times. If you, <laughs> your psychologist, your psychiatrist, or whoever it is, says, you have got this disease or that disease. Yeah, maybe. But there's more of you which hasn't got that disease. How about focusing on that part? Focusing on the flowers, not the weeds. If you water the flowers, then they grow. You've got a person who causes you a lot of trouble. They may be in your family, they may be your boss at work. Don't care who they are, we have to deal with difficult people. Are they difficult people? Is that a mistake? Thinking they're difficult people? Or just people who sometimes are difficult? If you think that they are difficult people, they will always be difficult. If you think they are people who do difficult things, sometimes, other times they do good things, then you have the solution. Watering the weeds just gets a weedy garden. Watering the flowers, if they do something which you acknowledge to be kind, caring, impressive, then give them a hug. Oh, thank you, boss. That's amazing you did. Thank you for that. And they do something rotten. Ignore it. 
It's amazing just how you can change people. For those of you who are married and think husbands can't be changed, that's bullshit, they can. <laughs> so easy when you know why, how. He does something really beautiful and wonderful. Emphasize it. Positive reinforcement. Expect kindness. Expect goodness. And you're more likely to get it. You expect, you know, selfishness. You anticipate just deceit. And that's what you'll get. That explains politics. You expect that. The media waters the weeds. All the amazing sacrifices, good things, which Donald Trump does. You don't believe that, do you? <laughs> <laughs> that we just, we don't see. We always see the weeds. That's no way to have a relationship. There's no way to have a better world. So, yourself. You. Have you got lots of faults in you? You're a really bad <laughs> monk. <laughs> if you focus on that, that grows, you know. Focus on the other side, the good side. But one last little story before I finish off the Q and A. Oh, positive reinforcement. You have to have a bit of wisdom behind it too. Otherwise, you get into big trouble. Like when I went to New York many years ago, I was told that there was a person who was making a fortune using positive reinforcement to train pets, especially puppies, which people wanted to have in their apartments in New York. Now puppy training in an apartment, because they didn't have houses where they had gardens, you can't allow the puppy to poo anywhere. So they had this company who trained puppies to only poo and wee in the appropriate place outside, in little parks or gardens or by a tree. And the way they did this, they would take the puppy outside into the appropriate area and they would wait and wait and wait until the puppy pooed or weed in the right place. And when they did, when they did, the trainer would punch the air! Yes! 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 would do cartwheels, would sing a happy song, and would just really go overboard in just celebration. And that the puppy learned. Positive reinforcement. And after a few days, that's the only place the little dog would do its business. And I thought, how wise that was. I never saw the, the danger, the, the, the problem with that. And after a while, when I saw the puppy, I thought, oh, what? Nothing of that. The problem was, having trained the puppy to do its business outside, some days the puppy would be you know, in the apartment, and the owner was watching the TV, and was watching like a baseball match or something, and somebody scored a home run. Yeah, yeah, yeah! And that's when the puppy would pull on the sofa. <laughs> <laughs> so the poor guy doesn't wind up his business. <laughs> but that doesn't work with husbands, with wives, with wives, with wives. <laughs> So that's the little thing. And curiosity, seeing just where this little um, dhamma actually can lead. And I'm always fascinated, just taking it to new places. So, let's do some questions now. I better shut up. <laughs> okay, now some questions about curiosity and the Dhamma. Yeah, okay. So, uh, Kao Jai Mai? Kao Jai, okay. She's tight. So, any questions about that? Yeah? How's the best way to stay curious when you're struggling? When you're struggling, it's curiosity is a natural part of the human consciousness, which is stymied by fear. You know, we're not encouraged to be curious. Uh, I've been to Google headquarters and other Google places sometimes and apparently the most productive days, I think on a Friday afternoon when there's no rules, you can investigate anything you want. So people get together and they've got some sort of idea, mostly stupid ideas, they're just curious. They just go for it. 
And actually, that reminded me of the ethos many years ago of Cambridge University. When I went in there, any idea, any proposal was just always said, yeah, see where it leads. Many of those proposals for research, now just by students like me, were absolutely ridiculous, wouldn't get anywhere. Part of a thousand stupid proposals, one would be made to break through. And that made everything worthwhile. So curiosity was encouraged. Challenging was encouraged. On the walls of the, of the Cavendish Laboratory, in Cambridge was squall, it was graffiti. The eminence of a great scientist is measured by the length of time they obstruct progress in their field. They obstruct progress. Because the more eminent they are, the more of an authority they are, we believe the less they can be wrong. So that's why the curiosity was encouraged. That's growth. There are problems in this world. We all know them. So, solutions? As I say, that, oh no, that was, that was, uh, not Star Wars, that was X-Files. The truth is out there. <laughs> Be curious. See where it leads. And it's so interesting. Same with meditation. Really, the truth is in here. So you're curious. What is this thing which knows? What is the mind? What is peace? What is happiness? What is beauty? And uh, many stories. Be curious to see the answer to those questions. Don't accept what other people say. Just use those as clues to see what they need. Fascinating. I'm oh, really curious to see how Buddhist nuns go in the West. Give it full power, see what happens. See how the dumb. This is actually, in my position now, I do actually happen to meet many politicians and world leaders. And you know what they'd say to me in private? They'd say that they're at their wit's end, trying to find solutions to intractable problems, real big problems. You may think it's easy with climate change or with the nuclear, the excellent ex, so of the, the expansion of nuclear arsenals, <coughs> mistrust between leaders. And most of the leaders, they really want to do the right thing. They are very, very much limited. They haven't got the freedom of power which people think they have. And sometimes they just, they're looking. Anyone got any ideas? They're bankrupt of ideas. The old ideas, the old ways just don't work. So that's why they ask even someone like me, any help? You know, even any Buddhist ideas can actually help? And I say, yeah, many. One of those I mentioned the other day, democracy. Just because it's been done many years, does that mean it's the best? Can't we improve it? And I'm suggesting this for many years. Of course you can. Don't ever think and assume that this is the best system. Don't actually just throw it all away. Can't we actually just improve what we have? Now one interesting idea, which I've been saying for a long time, two parts to this. First of all, for goodness sake, Let's stop electing people to our governments on the basis of what they promise to do for us. Politicians always make promises, but you elect them on what they say they're going to do. Which is total lies. No one knows what the future is going to be. Even I don't know what I'm going to say next. So I don't know. You know, everybody just makes it up as they go along. So, don't elect people on the basis of what they promise to do. Elect them on the basis of their past history. Their ability to work hard, be innovative, and most importantly, to be honest. So, if you 
He left people on their past abilities, their proven qualities, their track record, instead of what they promised, and have far greater gov better government. Number two, I may have mentioned this yesterday, why do we have to have a Prime Minister of the UK who was born in the UK? Can't we outsource? <laughs> Obama's not doing anything. Yeah. <laughs> if you've got, say, British Airways, does it have to be a, a British person who's a CEO of that company? Just because it's a flagship doesn't mean you have to have a British person. You would get the person who's the best for the job. Why does government have to be the leader of the government, has to be a person who's resident in that country. In fact, someone who's outside will probably have a much uh, more objective view where they're not so concerned about their own personal um, whatever. But why don't we outsource government? Interesting idea. The other thing was democracy. Why is it the one person, one vote? On something like climate change, for example. People who are over 60, like me, I probably won't be alive when the results happen. When the sea levels rise and devastate many parts of this place, and when water becomes such a more scarce a commodity than gold, when people fight just over land enough to live, I won't be here for that. Neither will be Theresa May or Mr. Turnbull over or, uh, in Australia. Kim Jong-un certainly won't be here. But these are the people who wield the most power. If you are company law, you vote according to how many shares you have in that company. The company is called life. How many shares have you got in life? What is your life expectancy? How many more years, you know, can you actually say, you know, roughly, as best we can assess, have you got left? That should be the number of votes you have. So, if you're in your seven, how old is Donald Trump now, 70 something? <laughs> yeah. yeah, how many years, maybe another 15, 20 years? So you should only have 15 votes, compared to an 18 year old, is liable to live another, say, 70, 80 years. Should have 70 votes. Weighted according to the shares you have in life, how the decisions which are made will affect you. There's a strong argument there. Rebirth. That's another question there. But uh, you're reborn into it. Anyone with any sense who does good karma will not get reborn. <laughs> That's why if only someone like Donald Trump believed in rebirth. I always say that when George W. Bush was invading Iraq, in his next life he will be born in Iraq. Wouldn't that be what? Well, it's a bit of a revenge tonight, but... There's <laughs> a natural justice there somewhere. <laughs> So, but anyway, it's thinking outside the box. And yeah, there's you know, things you have to tweak. You know, some people are white. You can get wiser you know, with age, so some people say you get more bigoted with age. But anyway, there's an argument there. And I've been saying that for such a long time. And last, Actually, just after the recent Australian election, they had an article about that in the Melbourne Age, saying exactly what I said. Let's try something new something a little bit out of the box if it works. But certainly it will give young people a much more interest in the democratic system. More young people will vote. And I think it will be amazing just the difference in government. Not vested interest what you have, but what you might have in the future when you're young. Sorry. Should do another question? Okay, another question. That's my political manifesto. The Agile Brown Party. <laughs> yeah, your question. Uh, is there a danger to over-analyse, over-worry all this self-help? Oh, yeah, of course there is. Look, I was just 
uh, this morning with my cousin. And she's got into this habit when he has breakfast of always sitting on the on the stairs. There's only two stools in the kitchen. So I said, Well, you're the owners of the house. When I first came in there to stay the night, I please told you that I'm a monk, but please make yourself at home. It was their home. <laughs> and it reminded me of my grandma. She was went through the Brits and little terraced house. It was in Acton, in East Acton, direct here in the house next door. Neighbours obliterated. And my mother, you know, she was lucky to get away with just a lacerated arm, blood all over the place. But my grandma, she was traumatised by that. But the way she dealt with the trauma, the way I knew it, every time there was a thunderstorm, lightning, she would stop what she was doing and she would just go and sit on the stairs. Of the, you know, the second story, the little flat she had. Because she was always told it was the safest place because the, the stairs were made out of solid stone. And she would, that's how she dealt with the trauma. And after the thunderstorm was over, she was back. Just not just as, you know, we call normal. It was accepted. There's ways. And I did read reports after the Paddington uh, train crash. Some very enterprising psychologists investigated not just the people who actually um, sought and were given free counselling by the government after that train crash, but those who didn't, and compared the two, just adjusting to those people what they'd seen, what they'd experienced. And the findings were so convincing. The people who went for counselling were far worse off than the people who didn't. I'm sorry, but that was, I can understand that. Counselors should be very careful. And sometimes what I hear does not make any sense to me in psychology. That's why I teach at psychology and to universities. Because you've got to take it a bit further. Be more curious about these things. And what you find you know, is if you keep on forcing a person to remember when they don't want to, and they don't need to. You're emphasizing you're watering weeds. And for many people it makes it worse. We have a culture these days of self revenge. Thinking the only way we could get freedom from the terrible things which happened to us was to find someone else to punish. Some sort of revenge. Sometimes we call that justice, but often it's just revenge. I'm sorry, but that's what it really is like. And that's how you, you don't solve problems that way. You don't learn from the past, you learn from the present. That's where the action of life is. And I've had arguments with top psychologists. They come around. You don't have to go through the past to let it go. You just let it go. Number one, it can be done. It can be done. You can let it go. Traumas. Let it go, and it, you're free of it. Number one, it can be done. Number two, it's in your interest to let it go. Look, someone hurt you. Every time you remember that, you're allowing them to hurt you again. Not just once, many, many times. Simple example. Someone calls you an idiot. What do you do? People think about it. They call me an idiot. He's a monk. He's got no right to call me an idiot. He should not call me an idiot. I am not an idiot. And then you finally realize that you've allowed him to call you an idiot three more times. You were an idiot. <laughs> Why do we always allow people to hurt us? Not once, but every time we remember it. So sometimes I refuse, in principle. Someone hurts me, says untrue things about me. I'm not going to allow them to hurt me again. Once is more than enough. Let it go. Powerful. Effective. It works. So that's why I'm really curious. You know, rebellious. Looking at things from a different angle and seeing if we can find some other solutions. That's what 
Buddhism, especially meditation, does you get so peaceful, so clear. When you come out of meditation, you're not um, you're not narrowly um, just confined into old ways of thinking. You see things other ways. It just happens. But if you just follow thought, 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 what you've been taught, a narrow range of thinking, you can't you can't think outside the box. You've got to get outside the box first to think outside the box. That's what meditation does to you. You become weird. <laughs> weird is cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another question. And sometimes people hear that I have this really good degree, great education, and now look, I've wasted it. Now, 66 years of age, no money, no investments, no security. You could have done something with your life, Ajahn Brahm. You're a loser. You've understood. <laughs> I'm a loser. Losing is great. Lose many of your traumas from the past. Lose your worries of the future. Lose, you know, all of your attachments, as many as you can. The more you lose, the more free you are. And I often say the biggest loser was not the winner of those TV shows. The biggest loser was the Buddha. He renounced let go of everything. Letting go is cool. Acquiring things is more burdens. That's thinking outside the box. It's going against the stream. Being a loser is great. Being a winner, pain in the butt. <laughs> Being a loser means you're free. No one expects anything of you. And you can be kind. You can stop in the race to help other people. Being a winner, you have to get to the line first. Yeah, question, yeah? The best way to investigate anger. If it's somebody else's anger, after they shouted at you, harassed you, when they you know, pause for breath, don't say anything. Give them one minute of silence. Because if you speak to them, immediately they finish. They have no opportunity to see what they've just done. One minute of silence after someone has shouted at you. Keep eye contact. No fear. So they can only be aware of one thing. The echo, if you like, of the stupid way they've just acted. Shouting. If you say something back, try to defend yourself, they have the opportunity to be mindful of what they say. Number two. If you are angry, you get angry, you've got a problem with anger, you know, just ask maybe your kid. They've got iPhones these days. Next time I get angry and shout at my husband or shout at somebody else, please take a video of it <laughs> and show it to me afterwards. Very effective way to have a look at how you behave, what you look like when you're angry. You see that a few times, you're so embarrassed. What, what am I doing? <laughs> this is, this, it doesn't feel right. Trouble is, when you are angry, you're not aware of yourself at all. You're totally focused on the object of that. That person should not do that. You're not actually being aware of yourself or it's doing to you. You're focused on the object. Not you. So turn the mindfulness back on yourself. Well, I don't want to be like that. It actually, getting angry at someone else is painful. You're on fire. It doesn't feel good. Let alone what it does to your body. The injury it does over the years. So anyway, that's one way of doing it. In Buddhism they say if you really get angry often, that your face gets stuck like that. <laughs> and you become a monster in your life next life. So frightening, so terrifying. Because an angry person does look like a monster. Yeah. Uh, John, um, 
How can you conquer a still and quietness? How can you kill that? Everything still and quiet around you. How can you kill it? Pass a tie, I? Can't pass a tie at much of high. Well, you see, I live on my own. Ah. And everything seems to be still. Okay. And uh, I, I depend on these of yours. Oh, I am your friend. I'm your boyfriend. On that. <laughs> <laughs> Day and night, and yeah. even go to sleep, and I cannot get to sleep without listening to it. Really, I sent you to sleep. That is, that is, <laughs> that is that bad? Yeah, that's not a bad thing to do. But and I, I don't even know when it ends or when it begins. As soon as it ends, when I wake up again, clock on my ear back again and, and, and yeah. how can I conquer it? Because it is bad or good. Yeah, well, it's not that bad. No, it's but not it, it can be better because sometimes to be able to listen to what it means. Have you got any more besides? Yeah. So after a while when the battery runs out. Oh yes, I'll make sure that it doesn't... No, let it run out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure that it's yeah. battery low, battery low. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the time to let it be low. Do you, have, have a, do you have a... Is this a first or second part? I know the second part. So you don't now, there is a second part. Oh. That is what you hear when the battery runs you, out. You, do, you don't have it with you then? No, I, I have it with me all the time. It's called silence. Oh, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, so let it run out. How can I, how can I conquer it? Because I cannot do without it. Yeah. And that is a very yeah. disturbing for me. Really. Okay. Do you like um, nature, the birds, the wind? Do I? Like nature. Tell my chart. Nature. Nature, Go, nature yeah. yes. Or Go out into the forest, into a park, yeah. and listen to the birds. Listen yeah. to the wind in the trees. Well, sometimes that gets disturbing as well. Yes. The wind. <laughs> the wind. Yeah. The wind is a gentle day. Something soothing is when you're talking. Yeah. Not soothing. But when yeah. I am... So you're not doing another one of these then? Yeah, <laughs> I'm doing it now. <laughs> See if you can listen to space between words. Space. We come some of you. I was hoping that you do because... I oh, did this many. Because I can remember these word by word okay. in every sentence and every... There is, if you ask your daughter... Is your daughter? Well, a friend. A friend. A friend, okay. Yeah. We used is, to go to Balloon. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's about a thousand of my talks on the yeah. internet. Yeah. So please get no some internet, more. No guided meditation. Guided meditations, yeah. yeah. On internet, I do of. meditation on my own. On my, I got the little room not where I have the Lord Buddha's figures. Yeah. You know. Very good. I think you can get many more of those yeah. on the internet. So there are over a thousand more. So plenty for you. So you are? You Mine, are, yeah. yeah. Your title is Ajahn Pram Pramaham Ramsey. Yeah. Pramaham Ramsey. Pramaham Ramsey. Ajahn Pramaham Ramsey. Ajahn Pramaham Ramsey. I had a CD of you two starting from when you used to have hmm. more pets and go to riding around right in front. I'm not sure of that one. But anyway, you <laughs> can get them afterwards. Okay. We've got five but I was interested to have this next one of these if you have. No, I don't have it with me, but you can you can get it for her yeah. on internet. internet yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Yes. By feeling, not thinking. 
So it's, we get so lost in our thoughts. We're really up here. So it's much better to come down here. So yeah, just, that's just go outside into nature. Yeah, get wet. Today's world, we always use umbrellas, raincoats, boots. We insulate ourselves from life. Just go out and see a sunset rather than seeing it on Nature Channel. So learn how to, to exist, to feel. Don't try and go somewhere. Be here. Every time new city I go to, when I arrived in London, it's supposed to be such a big city that I hardly saw any human beings in London. I saw many human goings, <laughs> many human doings, but hardly any human beings. Got it. Yeah, so you just be a human being. Not a going anyway. Not a doing. Okay, so it is actually time that we finished off. Uh, is it? Yeah, because we've got a train to catch. So you want to finish off with something? Come on, do some work. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for being here, and uh, I hope we'll see you all again. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Very nice. And uh, yeah. So outside, you can find the donation buckets and some bags that we've had made for our project, and you can read about it online. We'll be putting these talks online, and uh, hopefully come back to Birmingham. And I think the person who organised this was hoping to um, perhaps. Spread the word about a little meditation group in Birmingham, is that right? You wanted to organise something, right? Do you want to say a few words about that? Or? Well, it's You can invite me? You could invite me? Oh, yes. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> uh.